What is up, YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance Crew, and you're watching DaVinci Reacts. Uh, today, we're going to get into another episode, or another episode, another video from Atun Shea Films. This is uh, Checkmate Lincolnites. Did the Confederacy have better generals? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they did. Or at least I believe they did. Like, when you think of all, like, collectively, they pretty much did. I mean, the best general on the Union side, I believe, was Ulysses S. Grant. And even then, he had a war strategy very similar to Russia during the World Wars, where he pretty much just threw people <laughs> at uh, the enemy until eventually he was able to topple them. A lot of fatalities on his side. A lot of fatalities. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm curious to see where this is going to go, because this seems like based on my knowledge, which isn't a ton, <laughs> uh, this is an argument that goes in favor of the Confederate guy. So this is a chance for him to possibly <laughs> um, gloat, I guess. So let's go ahead and see what this has to offer. Um, I will have a link for a Tunche Films channel at the end of this video. You'll see an icon that pops up the last 30 seconds. If you click on it, it'll take you to their channel. You can like, subscribe, watch all the other good stuff. And I will have a link for the original video in the description box down below. You can click on that and watch the video if you don't want to see me, uh, or if you want to watch the video without me talking over it, or if you are a reactor yourself and want to do a reaction to it, or if you just want to show the video to somebody, that's the link that you will use. Uh, also, be sure to support the original uh, uploader. Check out the videos. Um, let's go ahead and jump into this. Oh, one second. Check. There we go. Mate. What? No. There must be somewhere old Jeff Davis can go. Nope. Might as well change his name to Norman C. Francis because he is done. What? Never mind. Just some local humor. Gracious. How long that game go on for? I'm sure he has a video about uh, that. Seven months. Well, this is ridiculous. I never stood a chance. You were fighting with one hand tied behind your back. What with all your industry and naval power and some such. Naval power? What board game were you playing? But I think <laughs> we both know who were the finer soldiers. Battleship. The men of the South. Never before. In all the annals of military history, were there a finer collection of officers at war than those of the Confederate States Army? Lee, Jackson, Forrest, Longstreet, we don't talk about him, uh, Early, <laughs> Beauregard, Mosby, and I'm sure there were some other ones too. Oh, the names of these men ring down through the generations as men of action, great masters of the art of war. If they were so good. Interesting why didn't word they with win? masters. Checkmate. Davis Sites. <laughs> I'm sorry, Billy, but it simply does not have quite the same ring to it as Checkmate, Lincolnites. It's all in the confidence. Checkmate, Davidites. Or Davis. I said David. Where we Checkmate, Davisites. <laughs> A disgusting Yankee right, lie, which dares it. to suggest that the sultry, balmy, beautiful <laughs> South seceded from the Union over the issue of slavery. <laughs> Could you imagine such a thing? Tonight, we shall prove once and for all the uncontested martial superiority of the Confederate soldier upon the field of battle. Was the snow That's it. right, folks. The best game <laughs> The Yankees won for a couple of reasons. They had more money and manpower. Given time, any fool mm. can win a war of attrition. That was part of it, sure, but don't you think you're overstating the case? Nope, 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 nope. No, sir. No, sir. We were doomed from the start, and we only held on for as long as we did because our brave boys fought like wildcats. In battle, one of us was worth ten of your feet, urban Yankees, and your immigrant hordes. Not to mention yeah, our Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, but, to be fair... The war did last as long as it did, I think, because the South were that good. <laughs> but it was only going to last for a very small amount of time. Like, they talk about a war of attrition, but the war only went four years, maybe five. And even then, they're lucky it stretched that far. <laughs> like, truth be told, if the North had, like, a better strategy, that war would have been about as fast as the damn war in Iraq. Like, it would have been like, a, it would have been that damn long. 
Daniel's commanders, who held on against the abolition army for longer than was thought possible, until after four years of arduous service, marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, we were compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. Oh, I see what you're doing there. You're quoting Lee's farewell address after his surrender at Appomattox. You know, it's interesting because with the very verbiage of that address, Lee abrogates his own personal responsibility for defeat. It was all just overwhelming numbers and resources. No other reason, certainly not Confederate mismanagement or the competency and skill of the United States Army. I mean, no, 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 that would be crazy. Well, now I think you've really lost it. The North's industrial capacity was massive. See this photograph? This is the shipyard of one William Webb in the East River and Manhattan. This. I mean, Gettysburg was pretty much a, an example of the North out, I want to say smarting, but out generaling the South. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like that would be a good example of the North just outdoing them in <laughs> in an example that is somewhat rare given the fact that the North had the entire like United States military behind them, or at least the United States military up until that point. I'm sure there are some people that was in the military that like deserted when the South seceded and they decided to go with their state, but yeah. I'm clad under construction is state of the art over 300 feet long, more than a match for any Confederate warship in use. However, this behemoth would never face the Confederate Navy, for it was commissioned by the Italian Navy and would see service in the Battle of Lisa against Austria-Hungary in 1866. See, the North's industrial capacity was so humongous that it could not only more than provide for its own military, but for the militaries of other nations as well. That's actually... Uh... A really interesting tidbit. But, you know, God isn't always on the side of the biggest battalions. History is full of wars where the side with the lower population and fewer resources won. You know, the Haitian Revolution, uh, the uh, Vietnam War, the Winter yeah. War, the list goes on. Hell, I think Winter you guys Wars had a better chance of beating us in the Civil War than we had of beating the British in the Revolutionary War. And once or twice, he almost did. Yeah. Yes. If only Jackson had survived his grievous wound to Chancellorsville. And went on to carry the day on July 1st at Culp's Hill. If only the Yankees had not found General Order 191 during the Maryland campaign, then old Moss Robert would have whooped Little Mac for show. If only the British had joined us in the fight, and a great army of red and gray went a marching all the way to Washington. If only Sherman would have spontaneously combusted at the Battle of Chattanooga, then Atlanta never would have fallen. If only we could have cloned Jeb Stewart so he could be in both the Western <laughs> and the Eastern theaters at the same time, that would have shown the Federals a thing or two. If only Judah P. Benjamin had unleashed the power of the Ark of the Covenant, Whoa. melting the faces <laughs> off of all those Yankees. I was about to say, let's just go ahead and do everything. If only Napoleon had been born in the South and was at the age that, uh, at the, like, grew up in, in, in what's, what's the term for it? Antebellum? And was of age when the Civil War broke out and he happened to become a general, then you would be sorry. It might as well bring George Patton and Douglas MacArthur and all of them, just all the great generals in history, put them in the South at that time. If only that happened. But it didn't. And you got your ass whooped. I'd like to formally apologize for what he just said about Judah P. Benjamin. The world. We surely <laughs> would have won the war then. Circling back, yeah, history has shown that a large industrial capacity doesn't always correlate with a nation's ability or willingness to make war. Lest we forget, there was substantial anti-war sentiment in the North throughout the Civil War, especially in the summer of 64, when the public perceived that the war was going extremely badly for the United States. Keep in mind, this was after Gettysburg and Vicksburg, when the tide supposedly turned against the rebels. Now, of course, in hindsight, it's easy to say, oh, well, the Confederacy was doomed at that point. But for people at the time, it was far from certain. 
During the grueling sieges of Petersburg and Atlanta, there was a tremendous amount of public pressure on President Lincoln to enter into peace negotiations with the Confederacy. It was only after Sherman's capture of Atlanta and Sheridan's scourging of the Shenandoah in 64 that the public began to regain hope that the war could be won. If the presidential election of 1864 had been held in August instead of November, then Lincoln probably would have lost and George McClellan would have become president. And if his timid conduct as commanding general of the army is any indication of how he would have conducted I learned the war this from oversimplified. I think it's pretty safe to say he would have given the rebels ample opportunity to bounce back. Timid, yes. On that we can agree. A fine administrator. Not such a great field commander. Oh, huh. I was half expecting you to defend McClellan and proclaim him as some sort of military mastermind. But not even you would stoop so low. How's that humble pie taste, Billy? <laughs> it's a little dry. Well, you can see to the point, so I shall graciously At least he's not eating crow. A favor. Perhaps I did exaggerate the role of industry in federal victory. However, if industry didn't do it, then they... Somewhere somebody's created an actual scary. humble pie, and Certainly I want to taste did. it. In the 20s and 30s, historian Frank L. Osley argued that the Confederacy had, quote, died of states' rights. Our commitment to freedom was too great that our states could not That's coordinate funny. under a strong central power, and it hamstrung our war effort. What are your thoughts? Owsley's full of shit. First off, his entire premise is a fiction. I mean, sure, Davis clashed with governors over stuff like troop allocations. Well, it's not that different from the defense, but these were revolutionary The importance war. of which he greatly exaggerated. But more importantly, I just don't buy that the Confederacy's internal divisions were responsible for its defeat. The North had to deal with internal division that was just as, if not more intense, than anything the South had to deal with. I mean, you take the 1863 draft riots, for instance, or the intense pressure on the Lincoln administration throughout the war for swift and spectacular battlefield victories, or the political polarization that followed the Emancipation Proclamation. Talk about hamstringing the war effort. No, anywhere you slice it, the Confederacy lost the Civil War on the field of battle. The Lincoln administration outmaneuvered them politically, and the boys in blue annihilated them militarily. Sometimes when you start a bar fight, you end up on the floor. It happens. I notice the hero worship of the northern generals, and even hatred of the southern generals from our SJW historian. <laughs> SJW <Why am> historian. <laughs> for a narrative to sell instead of facts. <laughs> Why don't we break it down? What's so great about all these secession generals? Go ahead, Johnny. Ball's in your court. I'll start mm. strong, shall I? Thomas J. Jackson. He expelled the Yankees from the Shenandoah Valley in a near flawless campaign of maneuver and decisively flanked Hooker's 11th Corps at Chancellorsville. He also froze during the Seven Days Battles when his lack of coordination with Lee and Longstreet caused horrifying numbers of unnecessary Confederate casualties. Look, I like Jackson, but I think his death was probably the best thing that could have happened to his reputation. He would have fallen from grace eventually. It was inevitable. I mean, could you imagine him fighting in the defensive grind of the Overland Campaign or the grueling trench warfare of Petersburg? His brilliance as an aggressive general was unmatched, but in many ways, he was kind of a one-trick pony. And I think a compelling uh -oh. argument could be made uh -oh. that Jackson's offensive tactics ultimately did more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Take Chancellorsville, for example. Sure, he won a flashy tactical victory that fills the pants of military history nerds with buckets of jizz, but what did he actually accomplish? Bad visual. In the grand scheme of things. He smashed the 11th Corps of the Union Army. Okay. And? And? <laughs> and he got a lot of his own troops killed. Troops that Lee could not afford to lose. Time and again, throughout the war, rebel generals tried to one-shot Union armies with dramatic Jacksonian offenses. Sure, they might maul a corps and gain a victory, but the Yankees always came back. They never realized that gambling everything on one climactic, decisive, war-winning battle was just a plain bad bet, and it always cost the Rebs more than they gained. Nick Picks, I say. You're finding fault where there is none. Stonewall Jackson was a mighty war chief, whereas the Union High Command, <laughs> it was a veritable menagerie of nincompoops. Burnside, Pope, Butler, Banks, Meade. Don't you dare talk shit about George Gordon Meade. Oh, God. <laughs> You'll scurry up to the top of the hill and wait for me to come charging after? Please, don't take much brains. Don't underestimate the high ground. Superior numbers. The only reason we did not carry the field to Gettysburg was because of that scallywag Longstreet dragging his heels instead of launching his crucial offensive in concert with Ewell and Ill's car. 
And then, once we retreated, that old snapping turtle me did nothing to pursue us, instead allowing us to return to Virginia unmolested. Oversimplified made Thanks the same joke. Next, Abraham Lincoln to no end. As the tyrant himself said. You fought and beat the enemy at Gettysburg. He was the original turtle course, before Mitch McConnell. Least, his loss was as great as yours. He retreated and you did not, as it seemed to me, pressingly pursue him. But a flood in the river detained him, till by slow degrees you were again upon him. You had at least 20,000 veteran troops directly with you, and as many more raw ones within supporting distance, all in addition to those who fought with you at Gettysburg. While it was not possible that he had received a single recruit, and yet you stood and let the flood run down, bridges be built, and the enemy move away at his leisure without attacking him. My dear General, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within your easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river, when you can take with you very few more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? Your golden opportunity is gone. And I am distressed immeasurably because of it. Ah, yes. He wrote that letter to Meade, but never sent it, because he realized that no good could come from chastising him after the fact. God, Lincoln was so fucking classy. <laughs> but you know, I think his criticism here was actually pretty unfair. <clears throat> what everybody seems to forget is that right after Gettysburg, Meade was under orders to keep his army between Lee and Washington, D.C. at all times. If he had just gone charging after the retreating Confederates, he would have been acting in violation of those orders. Also, his army had just won the biggest battle fought on North American soil. That's definitely a consideration. They'd lost a full quarter of their combat strength, and high casualties among high-ranking officers had effectively decapitated the army's leadership. It was also pissing rain that whole week, making all military operations more challenging. And while the Army of Northern Virginia was waiting for the swollen waters of the Potomac River to recede enough to ford, they dug entrenchments and threw up earthworks. They wanted Meade to attack them there. Didn't this beer used to be called Dixie? Meade was no Jackson, <laughs> right? Uh, he never attacked without good intelligence and solid knowledge of his enemy's dispositions. Was he a military genius? No. Did he make mistakes? Yeah, of course. But as far as I'm concerned, in the Gettysburg campaign, he did pretty much everything right. Lee didn't lose that battle. George Meade won it. Very well, Dan. That's right. I Dixie got wrecked. Shift our focus Everybody, to hashtag the Dixie oh, wrecked. You sure you want to do that, Johnny? I do. Prepare to quake in your boots, Billy Yank, and allow me to present the most daring cavalry commander of the war. You know him. You love him. It's Nathan Bedford Forrest. Rick Flair, Woo! ladies and gentlemen. Rick Flair. Nathan Bedford Forrest, right. Uh, slave trader, clan leader. Repentant clan leader. Oh, well, that's okay then. The South's greatest cavalry officer was indeed appointed first leader of the KKK. He tried his best to keep it an honorable organization. Robert E. Lee had been offered the job first, but feeling that it would violate his parole and feeling that a younger man was needed, suggested Forrest. The Klan was never an honorable organization. It was founded explicitly yeah. to terrorize black people and deprive them of their rights as American citizens. Now, yeah. Forrest worked hard to keep his association with the Klan secret, but it's not all that hard to piece everything together. In 1871, he was actually called to testify before Congress as part of an investigation into the Klan's terroristic activities. Here's what he had to say when Vermont Congressman Luke P. Poland asked him point blank if he was part of the Invisible Empire. Are you a member of the Ku Klux, General? I, I'm not, but I am in sympathy and will cooperate with them. I know they are charged with many crimes that they are not guilty of. What do you think of Negro suffrage? I am opposed to it under any and all circumstances, and in our convention urged our party not to commit themselves at all upon the subject. Of course. If the Negroes vote to enfranchise us, I do not think I would favor their disfranchisement. We will stand by those who help us, and I want you to understand distinctly that I am not an enemy to the Negro. We want him here among us. He is the only laboring class we have, and more than that, I 
would sooner trust him than the white scalawag or carpetbagger. When I entered the army, I took 47 Negroes into the army with me, and 45 of them were surrendered with me. I said to him at the start, this fight is against slavery. If we lose it, you will be made free. If we whip the fight, you stay with me and be good boys, I will set you free. In either case, you will be free. These boys stayed with me, drove my teams, and better confederates did not You know, just live. in black one case, black. you know, just in one case, you're guaranteed to be free. In another case, eh, you'll be free when we come around to it. Yeah, when we feel like it, you know. Yes, let me see him wet his pants over the idea of black confederates. In either case, you will be free. These boys stayed with me, drove my teams, and better confederates did not live. Black confederates! Black confederates! They were teamsters. Don't get excited. <laughs> Come on, we've been over this. Do you think the Ku Klux will try to intimidate the Negroes at the election? I do not think they will. Oh, However, boy. a black man named Andrew J. Flowers from Chattanooga also testified at the hearing, and he painted a very different picture of the Klan's activities in Tennessee. Do you now hold some office? Yes, sir. I am a justice of the peace. When were you chosen a justice of the peace? I was elected on the 4th of late August. Uh, justices of the peace in Tennessee elected by a vote of the people? Yes, sir. I was elected by a vote of the people. I want to inquire of you, particularly in reference to some violence, which it has been understood was committed upon you a short time ago. Tell us the story in reference to that. On the 18th, between 11 and 12, or 10 and 11 o'clock, I cannot say exactly which, I woke up and there was a crowd of men, all with masks around me, with pistols in their hands. They waked me up. They called me by my name. They took me out near a mile from the house. Tell all that they said. They asked me what was my name. I told them. Then some of them said, Oh yes, you are the man we are looking for, and so forth. One of them told me they were going to kill me. He had a pistol in his hand. After they got me outdoors, the captain of the organization, they called him Captain, told me that he was going to whip me said he would give me 25 lashes, that I had had the impudence to run against a white man for office and beat him, that they were not going to allow it, that it was an organization organized by them to stop Negroes holding office, and if they did not get out of office by being told or notified or whipped, they were going to kill them. They took me up about a mile from the house and hit me as many as 25 times. Did they take you into a woods or a swamp? They took me through the woods into an old field down near a swamp. I had never been there before. They took off my coat and whipped me with hickories seven or eight feet long. They said they were going to give me 25 lashes, and I guess they gave it to me. They told me that if I would promise to resign my office when I went to Chattanooga next morning, they would turn me loose. And I very readily promised it. They required you to promise to resign your office. Yes, sir. Flowers went on to describe how the Klan was using intimidation and violence to keep black men from voting, along with many other acts of domestic terrorism that Nathan Bedford Forrest not only aided and abetted, but more than likely orchestrated. Oh, you are dastardly Billy Yankin besmirching, General Forrest, so you know as well as I that in 1875 he gave a speech to a black civics organization in Memphis in which he said, We have but one flag, one country. You can say one thing and do another. Together. May differ in color, but not in sentiment. Many things have been said about me which are wrong, and which white and black thing older than America buy me through the wall besides go to work patriotism is hypocrisy. Live honestly and act truly, and when you are oppressed, I'll come to your relief. The speech went over stupendously, and as the crowd erupted in acclamation, one African-American woman gave the old general a bouquet of roses and a peck on the cheek. Yeah, he said that toward the end of Reconstruction, after the Klan's goal of reestablishing the antebellum social order had been accomplished. Southern Democrats were back in power at that point, and Forrest could afford to be magnanimous. I think his message here, though presented in a very nice and friendly way, was work hard, Stay in your lane, and we won't have a problem. Now, I'll grant you this, man. It is also entirely possible that Forrest did have a genuine change of heart. I'm not discounting that. A lot of people at the time thought so. In fact, when a lot of uh, Forrest's former comrades in gray heard about this speech, they shit a brick. 
One Confederate veterans group went so far as to publish this in their local paper. Clean doors no action unworthy of a southern gentleman. I speak of the address delivered before a black and tan audience by General Nathan Bedford Forrest. With what a glow of enthusiasm and thrill of pride have I not perused the campaigns of General Forrest's cavalry. Their heroic deeds, their sufferings, and their successes under the leadership of one whom I always considered, in my poor judgment, second only to our immortal Hampton. And now to mar all the luster attached to his name. His brain is turned by the civilities of a mulatto wench who presented him with a bouquet of roses. What can his object be? Ah, General Forrest. Well, Billy, I won't lie to you. That's really quite vile. I'm going to go ahead and say something real quick. And some people aren't going to like it, but I don't care because I'm going to say it anyway. Um... <clears throat> And this carries on with a discussion that I had in one of my Bo Burnham uh, reactions, uh, white straight male, in which I discussed white privilege and things like that. And I came up with, I, well, I came up with my personal definition of what I believe white privilege to be. Go watch that video if you want an explanation. Watch it first before you judge, because chances are, if you're going to assume my position, I can almost guarantee you're wrong. So go watch it and then come back and you know listen to the rest of this uh discussion um one of the things that i guess you could say white people in america had that black people didn't was that after slavery in particular black people weren't giving given anything to help start their life like a lot of people especially that are that are white when you come to america or your ancestors had immigrants that came to america for the most part, they were allowed from the very beginning to, you know, own a house, own land, establish themselves, get a job, uh, work, club, save money, build a fortune or whatever, pass it on to your kids. And that's something that can stay with your family for generations. With black people, it was like slaves weren't allowed to own land or do anything like that. If you became a free black person even if you did own something you were still expected to stay within your lane if you dare to aspire to be more than what was considered a typical black person you would usually get the wrath of the white people around you um somebody would come through and intimidate you tell you to uh stop being so uppity things like that normally try to force you to uh get back to a certain particular standard and when it came to other things like education and things like that, they did not want you in their schools. So usually you have to, I'm not sure if this was before or after the Dred Scott case. I believe it was after the Dred Scott case. Um, the whole separate, well, no, Dred Scott was something different, I believe. I'm thinking of Plessy Ferguson. Um, I don't know if it's before or after that, but that was the whole separate but equal segregation thing. And black facilities when it came to education and things like that were notably less um had lower quality than than the white counterparts um so even though like we could technically get an education at that point there was still roadblocks when you talk about voting uh, black people are still being disenfranchised whether it was through literacy tests or grandfather clauses or uh, poll taxes or anything like that. There were things put in place that were specifically designed to keep black people from being able to vote in favor of their own interest. Um, when it came to uh, where you could live, there was redlining that kept black people in certain areas, a uh, certain area, like you would keep them in a certain area and then you could intentionally, you know, focus on improving white areas but not worry about the black areas because you knew where the black people were at so you didn't have to worry about indirectly improving black people's lives because all the white people were here black people were here so we just focus in this area um and all this stuff carried on until the modern civil rights movement of the 50, 1950s 1960s 1970s uh i've told the story before my mother she came like when she first was going to school her first school was segregated i am the first generation in my family 
or I'm from the first generation in my family that didn't experience segregation. So like people pretend like this is something that happened hundreds of years ago. We're talking about one generation ago. Like my, my uh, grandparents, their houses were built. They didn't buy a house. They didn't own land necessarily. They built their house and well, I guess they would have to own land if they were able to build a house on it, but that's how you did it. Like they built their own house. They're from uh, a neighborhood that was pretty much constructed from the ground up. And like, that's just what it was. And before anybody goes, oh, well, you know, they built their neighborhood. So therefore they, it should have improved with value, right? No, because the area that they built it in West Virginia was a very heavy, heavily dependent coal town. So once coal dried up, the town was pretty much worthless. And that's what a lot of black people did. They established themselves in areas that they could find work in. And usually with for black people, work was the more manual. Oh, whoops. <laughs> was the more manual labor areas. Um, so it's like, a lot of black people are just now getting in a position where they can start their American lives. Because before that, a lot of people were stuck in a situation where they were at an automatic disadvantage from the, from the jump. Uh, one, someone in my uh, chat or comment section described white privilege in this way. They said that Nobody is saying that white people don't have problems because they do, or some people or white people have struggled too. But the issue is, can you say that your struggles are based on your skin color? Can you say that the problems that you experience are because of the color of your skin? Because black people, we can, we can bring up struggles that are exclusively because of the color of our skin. Um, The example that I always pull out is if you see two people walking down the street, you see a black person walking down the street to you, you see a white person walking down the street to you. Inside your heart, do you feel when you see one person, do you go, OK, I feel more safe walking by this person than the next person? You might be someone that goes eh, either one. I don't care. I feel the same way. But there are people that will say they feel more intimidated with the black person than the white person. The fact that they have that prejudged notion of the black person being more likely to do something to them or more likely to, let's say, rob or whatever the hell else, that is where the privilege comes from. It's the fact that you don't have this preconceived notion of being in some type of, or you don't have this preconceived notion of doing something in like in a negative way, just out outright. Now, a white person can, if given certain circumstances, can fall into that. Like, let's say the white person is bald headed with tattoos and big with a tank top, and the black dude is some skinny nerd with glasses. And yeah, in that case, it would be like that. But if you take two people with the exact same build, exact same look, exact same makeup, everything. More often than not, the person that's walking down the street with that person is going to look at the black person and think that it's a little bit more intimidating because all the, the things I described for the white person, the, the face tattoos, the bald head, the tank top, the muscular, all that stuff, being black is a trait that falls in that category. So it's like, even though they both have the same makeup, the fact that one is black and the one isn't, it's like having one of those traits, one of the, the face tattoo or the, it, it's something that goes in line with that because being black, a lot of times in people's head have that negative connotation to it. Even though they don't think that it does, it's just the, the way that you preconceive stuff. Some people overcompensate when they run into situations like that. Like 
you ever you ever run into somebody that let's say a white person that hears the n-word and they get too overly defensive of it and they try too hard to show they're down with the cause (laughs) usually that's the case they have a preconceived notion also of black that's negative but instead of going into it they try to do the opposite and overcompensate so it's like you still have it it's just that you're go- you're going out of your way to try to not be seen as having it <laughs> so it's like really it comes down to prejudice like i said there are cer- there are certain situations in certain countries or in certain areas where privilege goes for one group over another. If you're somewhere in Africa, chances are there's a lot of black privileges that people have that white people don't. If you're in an Asian country, there are a lot of Asian privileges that someone that's not Asian is probably going to uh, be at a disadvantage with. Um, It's just that America, it being a white nation that was founded on uh, I don't necessarily say it was founded on racist principles, but when it was founded, it had racist principles. So the fact that the foundation has that automatically means that that is just an advantage that's there. Same thing could be in England. Same thing could be in Ireland. Same thing could be in any other nation that was founded as white, because as humans, we are automatically instinctively instinctively built with a us first them uh mindset so from the very jump you're automatically going to have preconceived notions regardless of who you are i don't care if you want to pretend like you're you don't have that that's a lie everybody has preconceived notions period if you see somebody there's nobody that sees someone just is 100 blank nothing if you see someone chances are based on how they're dressed or how they look or something you're going to come up with some type of preconceived notion period that's just how it is now how do we fix that that's an entirely different discussion but that is what i think of when i think of white privilege like i said there are other privileges there are black privileges in the other video i uh the, the bo burnham video i mentioned this example too A white person walking down the street in the ghetto, black person walking down the street in the ghetto, a black person is going to look at them and usually nine times out of 10 are going to say that person seems like they would be uh, less likely to cause crap (laughs) if I or not cause crap. But if, if I choose to intimidate them in some way, like it's less likely they're going to do something about it. If you're playing basketball and you know, you are getting physical, you're, well, this is more of a bully mindset, but a bully would be more likely to look like, look at the white person and go, that person isn't going to fight back. Even though that's bullshit because obviously white people will fight back, but that's just a preconceived notion that some people have. Um, Yeah, I mean, as a basketball player with me, it's like, if I see a white person on the court my instinctive mindset is to tell me that person's probably a good shooter <laughs> because that's usually how like the, the 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 stereotype goes like you see a white person on the court they're a shooter they they're gonna be behind the three-point line knocking them down all day you see someone tall your instinct is to go oh they're gonna be a banger in the inside you give them the ball they're going so if you see a tall person and you give them the ball and they run out to the three-point line and start chucking up threes i don't care If you're a decent three point shooter, get your ass under that that basket and get those inside shots. That's that's just how that type of thing is with the pre uh, the pre judging and things like that. Now, obviously, it's not always right. That's the reason why you're not supposed to prejudge, because just because there's a stereotype around it does not mean that's how people are. People are individuals and one person might fall into this but another person don't so don't judge that other person based on what the first person does that's that's all i gotta say about it but that is my definition or my idea of white privilege
Can we go back to talking about military history? And <laughs> okay, I mean, yes, we can. We can. <laughs> comfortable and safe. One more point. Listen, Forrest is unbelievable. That actually went very right. well with what I said. He was, in general. <laughs> he was also a mass murdering terrorist piece of shit and should be remembered as such. In my opinion, just about every positive mention of his generalship should be accompanied by extreme moral condemnation and acknowledgement of the U.S. colored troops he massacred without quarter at Fort Pillow. But, but, but can't we celebrate his military achievements without glorifying his less savory attributes? Yeah, and we could also celebrate Osama bin Laden's dexterous use of Expedia.com, but that'd be pretty fucking weird, wouldn't it? You know what I think? Kind I think of, you're yeah. compensating for something. Y'all didn't have a daring, brilliant cavalry commander on your side during the war. I'd actually kind of disagree with him on that, though. I think it's okay to acknowledge someone's good qualities while still, as long as you still condemn them, them, condemn them for the bad that they did. It's like, kind of like with the last election, the primary election, uh, a lot of um, Democratic nominees gave Bernie Sanders a lot of shit because he dared to say that Fidel Castro had a good literacy program even though he did, but because it sounded like he was praising Fidel Castro on something, it automatically meant that it, he was supporting him, I guess, but that's bullshit. If someone does something good, you can acknowledge that what they did was a good thing. And the same thing goes for like, when people talk about Trump, like Trump does a lot of heinous fucking things, but if he does do something good, it's something good. It doesn't matter if he did it. If somebody else did it, you would call it good. So why is it all of a sudden bad that they did the exact same thing? And again, you can flip it for bad too. Trump did things that I consider bad that Obama did. I consider when Obama did it to be bad. <laughs> like There's a lot of people that will look at something that Obama did and say, oh, that was great. And then when Trump does it, they have a problem with it. There's some things that Obama did that were good that now that Trump did it, they consider it to be bad. I mean, truth is the truth. Same for something. Y'all didn't have a daring, brilliant cavalry commander. You can acknowledge someone did something good without supporting them. Trying to knock one of ours down a peg. I'll see your Nathan Bedford Forrest and raise you Colonel Benjamin H. Grierson, who led a ridiculously clever cavalry raid down the length of Mississippi during the Vicksburg campaign. This is going to be a Though long the video, initial purpose of the raid was to cut the railroad east of Jackson, Mississippi, Grierson went above and beyond the call of duty, going from LaGrange, Tennessee to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, wreaking havoc all the while. Grierson and his troopers broke up two other railroads, destroyed weapons and commissary stores, burned storehouses, disabled trains, and freed slaves. All in all, they inflicted millions of dollars worth of property damage on Mississippi and permanently crippled that state's military usefulness for the rest of the war. They also diverted substantial numbers of Confederate cavalry that were badly needed in the defense of Vicksburg itself. But possibly most impressive of all, Grierson accomplished all of this at the cost of three men killed and seven wounded. Contrast that with Forrest's raids. Sure, they were flashy and daring, but did they make a huge difference to the outcome of those campaigns? I wouldn't say so. And to my mind, I think you guys only had one strategically minded general who thought of things in terms of the big picture rather than individual maneuvers and battles. And he was, of course, Robert Joseph E. Johnston. E. <laughs> oh, Joseph E. Johnston. I think he was the only senior Confederate general who understood that when you're fighting with limited manpower, you need to pick your battles literally very, very carefully. Most other rebel generals thought of war in terms of attacking or defending dots on a map. They were very geographic in the way they went about it. But Johnston understood that when you're outnumbered and outgunned, stubbornly holding on to bits of dirt can often be counterproductive. Maneuver, even... I'm going to try to say this real quick because I don't want to, like I said, this video is going to be long. So I'm going to try to keep the pausing to a minimum as much as I can. Um, when it comes to war of attrition, when you're talking about a war where you have a group of rebels fighting against a established country or someone that's already established, the advantage is in the rebels area when it comes to attrition. So if you're going to have a war it's okay to, I guess, take your time and pick your moments because the established side, they're the ones that have a public that they have to appease as well. 
And it's more likely that the public on that side is going to um, fall into the, okay, that's enough of this. We're tired of it. Do something, like end it. We don't care. <laughs> Whereas the rebels are more likely to be like, no, keep fighting. We can do this. Let's go. Like whether it's the war of independence with the British eventually going like, you know what? Screw it. We don't care. We've already lost too much. Let's keep it going. Like Let's just end it. Whereas on the rebel side, it's like, no matter how dire the situation got, not rebel, as far as the American uh, patriots are concerned, it's like, no matter how bad the situation was, it's like, you got to keep fighting. Because not only do they have the biggest risk, but they also have the biggest reward. If they lose, all of them are likely going to get killed and their legacies are going to be tarnished. If they win, then they're the greatest of heroes and they establish themselves in their new republic or estate or whatever you want to call it. Uh, same thing with the rebels in this case. The side that had the, I mean, the side that was pretty much saying, okay, we have to come up with a, a finish to this before a certain time. Otherwise, we're, we're done. We, we don't care was the union the union was the one that was pushed against the clock because had the war dragged on longer the union would have been the one looking to settle it whereas the confederates would have probably kept fighting as long as they could but i mean they ended up losing so it didn't really come to that but strategic retreat can be much more beneficial in the long run. There is no way to fight with honor. Yeah, that's what Jeff Davis often said, which is exactly why Johnston hated him so much and privately talked all sorts of shit about Jackson and Lee. Whereas, it must be said, our side was full of keenly strategic military minds. Look no further than George Henry Thomas, the Virginian Unionist. Like Meade, that is he was John Goodman. You can't fool me. Imperiled the lives of his men unnecessarily, but unlike Meade, he was creative. He was adaptable. He could always shift his strategy in the chaotic and ever-changing circumstances of warfare. George Thomas, that, that is strange. I really haven't heard much about this faithless Virginian. Well, that's because he was modest to a fault. In fact, he probably wouldn't want me to even mention him in this video because he never wrote a memoir and he even destroyed his wartime correspondences because he couldn't stand the idea of future generations picking over the events of his life. He also faced a lot of discrimination from his northern superiors because of his southern origins, and he was often overlooked for promotions and acclamations. <laughs> Typical. I'm with you there. And ever since, General Thomas has been kind of forgotten about by historians, despite the fact that he was a huge badass. In a skirmish before the first Battle of Bull Run, he actually went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Stonewall Jackson and kicked his fucking ass. At the disastrous Battle of Chickamauga, when William Rosencrantz, the Union Army commander, fled the field, Thomas remained behind, fighting on alone with his men against the whole Reb army, badly outnumbered and outflanked. And this holding action single-handedly saved the Army of the Cumberland from complete destruction. And two months later, United States forces would get their revenge at the Battle of Missionary Ridge, where Thomas and William Tecumseh <laughs> Sherman orchestrated Missionary. a frontal attack on the Confederate center that shattered their lines, and those lines, might I add, were entrenched on high ground. And then, high in December ground. 1864, Thomas it. faced off against John Bell Hood, who sucks, by the way, in the Battle of Nashville, and destroyed his army. That's not hyperbole. He literally destroyed it. The Army of the Tennessee was laid low. Its ruin smote upon the mountainside. There would be no more large-scale fighting west of the Appalachians for the remainder of the war. George Thomas never lost a movement or a battle, and may very well have been the best general on either side in the entire conflict. Lord almighty, what else this fella do, cure cancer? <laughs> Though as far as good Union generals go, there's one person that we haven't talked about yet. Let me guess, Sherman. Do it again, Uncle Billy! <laughs> Spare me your memes, sir. <laughs> Besides, we've already done an entire episode about him. Mm. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Sherman is but the apprentice. He 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to add to the atmosphere. I like how he has the little light that like has the little pull cord. Johnny? Johnny? Hey! Are you alright? We were talking, you just started screaming. Are you alright? Yes, I'm, I'm fine. I, just a... Just a minor hallucination. Do you... Hallucinate often? No? <laughs> anyway, about Ulysses S. Grant. I mean, he was just... <laughs> A beast. I mean, that's the man who saved the Union. Oh, so now Grant wasn't a drunk and didn't run up a horrific casualty rate amongst his troops. Forget the lost cause. All currently revisionist history has done to canonize the North and demonize the South. Well, that depends on what you mean. I'm sorry, but that's just how rebellions work. Like, if you are on the side of a rebellion that fails, you're going to be demonized, regardless of what the outcome was. The idea that, like, that's not going to happen is stupid. Like there were people that during the January 6th thing, some people were saying like, Oh, but uh, like some of them, some of the people on January 6th were describing themselves like the, the American Patriots in 1776 and saying how like they go down as uh, heroes. Like they did. No, you won't because you failed. That's, had the the patriots in 1776 failed they would have been seen as traitors and they would be they would be the enemy of england or britain period that would have been period point blank done they would be considered the worst of the worst and at best george washington would have a damn mask or something made for himself like uh the V for Vendetta dude. I forgot his name. I know who it is, but for some reason his name is on the tip of my tongue. But that that would be George Washington's legacy. Hopefully, at some point in the future, some millennials would try to turn him into a meme. That 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 would be it. <laughs> but up until that point, he would have been considered a traitor, and uh, well, his legacy would have been destroyed. That's what happens when you rebel and fail. You are seen as the enemy and are demonized forever. Had the Nazis won, they would not be anywhere near as vilified as they are right now, but they lost. So guess who the next enemy for all the damn first person shooter games for the next 50 years is gonna be, <laughs> period. I'm sorry, but that's how it is. If they ever make a first person shooter game in the Civil War, chances are you know which side is gonna be the good side and which side is gonna be the bad side. Sorry, that's how it works. History has done to canonize the North and demonize the South. Well, that depends on what you mean by a drunk. I mean, he definitely abused alcohol, but whether he was a occasional binge drinker or a, you want some? Uh, or a full-fledged alcoholic, I mean, that's kind of hard to determine. Cheers. Cheers. If the Butcher Grant is the best you Yankees have to offer, then I'm afraid you are in a heap of trouble. For there is simply no comparison betwixt the Butcher Grant and old Mars Robert E. Lee. In the words of Jubal Early, Shall I compare General Lee to his successful antagonist? May as well compare the Great Pyramid which rears its majestic proportions at the Valley of the Nile to a pygmy perched atop Mount Atlas. Nice one, Jubal. Wonderful use of very specific North African imagery. You really showed that butcher Grant what what? You keep calling Grant a butcher. Why is that? Because his generalship contained no spark of military genius. His idea of war was to because it's a buzzword. Be rude. No strategy. The mere application of the wings in her tear. Uh. He had none of that quick perception of the field of action which decides it by sudden strokes. 
He had no conception of war beyond the momentum of numbers. Such was the man who marshaled all the material resources of the North to crush the little army and overcome the consummate skill of General Lee. That's a very common and especially Eastern theater-centric misconception, and it mainly stems from Grant's battles against Lee in 1864, namely the Overland Campaign. And yes, to be fair, the casualties in that campaign were appallingly high on both sides. And though we all eventually won, your casualties were higher than ours. We lost approximately 33,000 men killed, wounded, or missing. Y'all lost 55,000 men killed, wounded, or missing. Well, we were on the offensive during the Overland Campaign, and attackers do tend to take more casualties than defenders, especially since the war was becoming steadily more brutal, as tactics slowly transitioned between Napoleonic-style open-field-type warfare and kind of proto-World War I deeply entrenched warfare of attrition. That was not the sort of campaign that Grant was trying to fight, by the way. Uh, he actually wanted to maneuver Lee into fighting an old-fashioned, open-field type of battle, where he could bring his superior numbers to bear more effectively. But it was Lee who decided to entrench, so he could better protect Richmond and Petersburg. It had been something he had been threatening to do for a very long time. But Grant was grimly determined, and kept the pressure up until the United States achieved a costly but decisive victory. But what about the Yankee defeat at Cold Harbor? Or the turkey shoot slaughter at the Battle of the Crater? Yeah, I mean, those two failed attacks were huge mistakes, and resulted in a horrendous and completely unnecessary loss of life. But it's important to understand that those missteps were the exception of Grant's generalship, not the norm. You see, Grant had a truly national view of the conflict. Now, there's no way to say this without coming across at least a little bit cold-blooded, but it's a tragic fact. The carnage of the Overland Campaign was necessary to bring the war to a timely conclusion, which Grant did after less than a year in overall command of the United States forces. Contrast that with his predecessors in the East, like McClellan or Burnside, who racked up significantly higher casualties than Grant did, with significantly less to show for it. Grant and Lincoln had a very specific strategy in Virginia at the end of the war, to grab Lee by the neck and to squeeze and to keep squeezing, never giving him a moment's repose, never allowing him for a second to even think about going on the offensive. Mr. President, if we are to draw troops from the field, it will prove difficult to suppress the rebellion in the disloyal states. My withdrawal now from the James River would ensure the defeat of Sherman. <coughs> General Grant, I have seen your dispatch expressing your unwillingness to break your hold where you are. Neither am I willing. Hold on with a bulldog grip and chew and choke as much as possible. And as battered as Grant's army was, Lee's had suffered far worse, losing a full half of its combat strength in the Overland Campaign alone. And while the United States could always augment its forces with fresh troops, the Confederate states were running out of options. As Grant himself reflected, The rebels have now in their ranks their last man. The little boys and old men are guarding prisoners, guarding railroad bridges, and forming a good number of their garrisons for entrenched positions. A man lost by them cannot be replaced. They have robbed the cradle and the grave equally to get their present force. Besides what they lose in frequent battles and skirmishes, they are now losing from desertions and other causes at least one regiment per day. Sounds an awful lot like what I was just saying about overwhelming us with numbers. That was robbed the cradle and grave was line was a badass line. The Union had learned from experience. That's a bar in a rap battle. Numbers <laughs> and resources don't win wars on their own. Robert E. Lee so versus Ulysses S. Grant. A general epic rap battle. I, I, I want to see those it. numbers and resources, which is exactly what Grant did. He pinned the Army of Northern Virginia down in Richmond and Petersburg while Sherman ravaged the Deep South and closed Lee's back They both have good things Joe and Johnston bad things they can mention. Beauregard, who were at that time defending Georgia and the Carolinas respectively, did all they could to keep that trap from swinging shut. But Lee, meanwhile, just froze. He stayed put, and he allowed himself to be obliterated. Nonsense. Protecting Richmond and our senator government was essential to our survival as a nation. Okay, but while Lee was busy defending Virginia to the last, Sherman snuck up behind him and rammed a boot up his ass. It was a losing strategy, and Lee is more culpable than visual. he realized. Didn't need. <laughs> for what shall it profit a man if he gains Virginia, but loses the whole South? But for most of the war, Lee's entire mandate was his beloved Virginia. 
He wasn't even appointed general in chief of all Confederate armies until February of 65. Maybe not officially, but Lee was massively influential on the Confederacy and had been since 1862. And I mean, shit, he was the face of the rebellion. Lee was myopic about defending his home state. And multiple times, when key positions in the Western theater were under dire threat, he flat out refused to send any of his troops to help. In mid-1863, when uh, Grant was tightening the noose around Vicksburg and the rebel army ensconced there, Confederate Secretary of War James Seddon urged Lee to send George Pickett's division west. Lee responded uh, with a refusal, of course, and it was full of excuses, some reasonable, others bizarre. The adoption of your proposition is hazardous, and it becomes a question between Virginia and the Mississippi. The distance and uncertainty of the employment of the troops are unfavorable. If you determine to send Pickett's division to General Pemberton, I presume it will not reach him until the last of this month. If anything is done in that quarter, it will be over in that time, as the climate in June will force the enemy to retire. I think troops ordered from Virginia to the Mississippi at this season would be greatly endangered by the climate. And the one time Lee did acquiesce to reinforcing the West when he sent Longstreet's Corps to North Georgia, it made a key difference in defeating the U.S. Army at Chickamauga. And then the scalawag allowed himself to get licked by Ambrose Burnside, of all people. <laughs> Pathetic. In any event, Lee was right. He was handily outnumbered, and he hadn't a man to spare. Well, then, why did he always get them killed at such an astounding rate? If anybody deserves to be called a butcher, it's Bobby Lee. Moss Robert? No, no. He, he loved us. He never threw our lives away <laughs> needlessly. Except he totally did. Like, all the time. Nope, 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 nope. That's your boy Grant you're thinking of. He didn't care a whit about his men. He just threw waves of conscripted children to their deaths. Let's crunch some numbers. Lee's greatest victory was the Battle of Chancellorsville. His army was about 60,000 strong and suffered nearly 13,000 casualties, a net loss of 22%. His opponent, Joe Hooker, doing. had an army 133,000 strong doing. and suffered he's about 17,000 casualties, the percentage a net thing. loss of 12%. The victory, though tactically brilliant, gained no ground for the Confederacy, reaped no major strategic benefit, and resulted in the death of Stonewall Jackson, one of Lee's best generals. Grant's greatest victory was the Siege of Vicksburg. His army was 45,000 strong and suffered 3,000 casualties, a net loss of 7%. His opponent, John Pemberton, had an army about 40,000 strong and suffered 7,000 casualties dead, wounded, or missing as well as a staggering 33,000 captured, a net loss of effectively 100%. The victory secured the Union's complete control of the Mississippi River and brought about the capture of the nearby state capital of Jackson. It ended rebel resistance in the region, exposed the Confederacy's soft underbelly of East Tennessee and Georgia, and was a crucial step toward final victory. Throughout the war, in the battles for which reliable statistics exist, Lee suffered an average killed or wounded casualty rate of 20.2%, and inflicted an average killed or wounded casualty rate of 15.4%. In total, 121,000 of the men under his command were killed and wounded, the highest of any general in the Civil War. Grant, on the other hand, suffered an average killed or wounded casualty rate of 18.1%, and inflicted an average killed or wounded casualty rate of 20.7%. It's like sports statistics. In total, 94,000 of the men under his command were killed and wounded, 23,000 in the Western Theater, and 71,000 in the East. Look. Lee was a good general, sure. I venture to say he did a better job leading the Army of Northern Virginia than I would have done. I'm not trying to unduly demonize him here or exaggerate his faults, but a military genius? The greatest field commander in American history? No. That's a fairy tale, born from more than a century of creepy pseudo-religious deification. In many ways, the comparison between Grant and Lee tells us all we need to know about <laughs> why the war went the way it did. Lee led with the power of personality. He thought that war should be grand, sweeping, and heroic. He loved dramatic charges and clever tactical sleights of hand. He considered logistics to be an annoyance rather than an opportunity, which is why Confederate military history is full of flashy daring do, but pretty short on substantial operational success. Grant, meanwhile, was all stubbornness and pragmatism. War was not a game to him. There was nothing poetic about it. 
Like his buddy Sherman, he believed that to wage war meant to bring it to a favorable conclusion as quickly as possible. And to achieve victory, he used every tool available to him. Deception, diversion, maneuver, relentless attack, and dogged defense, and never lost sight of the big picture. Battles didn't really matter that much in of themselves. They were just stepping stones toward the distant goal of ultimate victory. And that's why, for the most part, the Confederacy did not have better generals. You were obsessing over tactics while we were planning strategies. You thought small, we thought big. That's why we won. Look at you. Smugly conducting military campaigns 150 years after the fact from the comfort of your armchair. This chair doesn't have arms. Generalship aside, Lee was by far the better man. Look no further than how Grant and Lee treated their slaves. Grant kept his and said he not raise his sword to free any slave. Lee, on the other hand, freed his. He acquired them in marriage and treated them justly. That's maybe like a quarter true. In the mid-1850s, Grant did manage about 30 enslaved people at his father-in-law's farm. By all accounts, he was a terrible slave driver because he was too gentle with them. A woke slave driver is still a slave driver. I couldn't agree more. And Grant was, briefly, a slaveholder himself. He owned a man named William Jones for about a year before freeing him in March of 1859. Yes, Grant was a slave owner. And General Lee was, of course, an abolitionist. No. He called slavery a moral and political evil. I have a quote. In this in I mean, so did Thomas Jefferson, too, but... but what we'll acknowledge, that slavery as an institution is a moral and political evil in any country. Yeah, and in that same letter, he also says... The systematic and progressive efforts of abolitionists to interfere with and change the domestic institutions of the South are truthfully and faithfully expressed. The consequences of their plans and purposes are also clearly set forth, and they must also be aware that their object is both unlawful and entirely foreign to them, and can only be accomplished by them through the agency of a civil and servile war. The blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, socially, and physically. The painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their instruction as a race. How long their subjugation may be necessary is known and ordered by a wise and merciful providence. So, based on what I, this, it seems like he's someone that believes, he holds his personal opinion on a certain thing, but then he acts when it comes to what he thinks the national thing is. He, like, he he believes one thing but he doesn't express that when it comes to his political beliefs i guess in a far lesser extent <laughs> it would be like me um let me see what's what's an example personally i tend to fall on conservative sides of arguments on things but political or not politically but when it comes to the way I vote and things like that, I fall much more liberal. Because in my opinion, people shouldn't be, shouldn't have to live based on what I consider to be ideal. You should be free to come up with your own, or you should be free to live your life however you want to live it, not based on how I live my life. So it's like, I have my way of, doing things over here but that by no means is how i see the way other people should live as well like i guess in a certain flipped way he's kind of like that like he thinks that slavery is immoral but he thinks that from on a national stand like perspective it's this way so i mean clearly it's wrong and like I said, with him, it's like flipped. Whereas me, I, I tend to reserve myself a lot, but when it comes to the overall perspective, I think there should be a lot more like freedoms for people to do whatever the hell they want. I hold myself to a certain standard. I don't expect other people to live by that standard. Whereas with him, it's like his standard was the way he sees slavery, but he doesn't expect 
the South to be held to that standard, even though he should have. <laughs> but it's like a twisted way of doing, like a, the same way of thinking, but just opposite moral uh, alliances. If Lee believed slavery was an evil, he thought it was a necessary one. And actions speak louder than words, right? The hiring records show that Lee Very personally true. owned people until at least 1852 and frequently sold or traded them away at his own convenience, even though that meant breaking up their families. Evidence from his personal letters shows that when Lee did free his slaves, he didn't do it out of the kindness of his heart, but rather because he hated supervising them and didn't want them around. When he briefly managed his wife's slaves at their house in Arlington, he was a notoriously cruel slave master and drove his people hard. As late as July 1860, he considered buying even more slaves and rented out slaves as personal servants throughout the entire Civil War. Well, I mean, it's not a I'm not done. Politically, <laughs> he consistently supported pro-slavery policies, and after the war upheld laws specifically designed to restrict the rights of freedmen. He also frequently expressed racist views, which were certainly very much in keeping with his time, but are still a far cry from our popular image of the kindly General Lee. During his time in Mexico, he found the people of that country to be quick, primitive in their habits and tastes. He referred to Native Americans as hideous, uninteresting. And the only people he seemed to have any affection for at all were, predictably, though climate, government, and circumstance have produced Why does it sound like he's talking shit about people on like a Tinder while, as he swipes they left? Resemble the races from which they are sprung. And to no race are we indebted for the virtues and qualifications which constitute a great people than the anglo saxon Your sainted Grant was no better. Did you know that he was... You know what's funny? The Nazis got a lot of their ideals or the way they expressed their ideals from like Confederate America, or at least one of the areas that they did. And it's very funny that nowadays we can easily put them in the perspective that they deserve to be in about how evil they were. But those same people will come up with like excuses for certain types of uh, leaders in America, even though, like I said, what they believed is almost a foundation for what pushed the Nazis. <laughs> like, how is this any different? for the virtues and qualifications which constitute a great people than the anglo sex Your sainted Grant was no better. Did you know that he was a rabid anti-Semite? In December of 1862, a handful of businessmen, some of them Jewish, were illegally selling cotton in Grant's military district. So he issued General Orders Number 11, which expelled all Jewish people from the area under his military control. The order read, The Jews, as a class, violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department, and also Department Orders, are hereby expelled from the Department. Yeah, and the verbiage of the order reflects old European stereotypes about Jews, too. So, yeah. a super bad look, and you will not find any argument from me. Unsurprisingly, or perhaps surprisingly, the order was met with general public outrage. Lincoln was horrified and immediately rescinded Grant's edict. And though the general insisted that it was all a big misunderstanding, the controversy would haunt him for the rest of his life. Especially during As it his should. presidential run, he issued multiple public apologies. Was he sincere? Who is to say? It was politics. I mean, he was a politician. Chances are he wasn't. You know, Johnny, here's what I think it really comes down to as far as how we choose to remember these men. Here's what I think. Are you ready? Spit it out. Here's what I think. Ulysses S. Grant was instrumental in bringing about the end of slavery in this country. Bobby Lee tried his very best to keep the damn thing going. Agree to disagree. We always get diverted into talking about race. It's almost as if racism and the Civil War are pretty closely interrelated. I must say, sir, I found your arguments thoroughly unconvincing. And if I may be so bold as to remark, even more biased than usual. You know, I really don't like it when you say those sorts of horrible things about General Lee. Look, Johnny, I I'm not trying to pick on you, all right? It's just that lost causers have been sucking Lee's dick for 140 years. It's like the longest blowjob in American history, and it's left <laughs> a real stain on this country. I'm not trying to stain on the dress of this monster. country. I'm just 
course correcting against generations of hero worship. Well, could have fooled me. And I believe so that I shall take my leave of you now. Come on, dude. Don't be like that. See you in hell, Billy Yank. See you in hell, Johnny Reb. Makes it sound like this is the end of the entire series. Is this the end of Checkmate League of Knights? Will there be no more Billy Yank and Johnny Rebel? <laughs> what can we make of the, the, the blowjob dress? Find out next time, possibly, on Checkmate Lincolnites. Yeah, honestly, I do not know. What the hell? Some that that I I know a virus when I see one. That was a virus name. That's a damn virus. Watch yourself, Atun Shay. Watch yourself. <laughs> Uh, no, let me go ahead and keep it going because there might be some hidden scenes in here, maybe. Yep, there we go. Damn, give it a second. My, my computer is taking its time. There we go. Uh oh, that's Nazi. That's Nazi. He's still under checkmate. Doesn't matter. Peace out. Well, we're going to see what that said. There we go. Eric, her, please try. Oh, it's just a YouTube thing. Any more? So, yeah, no more. Oh, man. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I like watching videos like this is because, like I said, it definitely creates a much broader discussion that I can have on this channel. Um, I've already talked a lot about it. Uh, there were some things that I said that I would like to elaborate deeper on because I feel like there's some stuff that could be misunderstood. Um, but as someone that don't really have the time to continue it anymore. Not to mention I'm extremely lazy. Um, I probably won't unless it requires attention. <laughs> but uh, yeah, one thing I did want to say before I ended it to clear something up. When I talked about the whole white privilege thing, the examples I gave were two different types of white privilege. And that was intentional. Like, I wanted to talk about it from a historical uh, perspective of black people being in a position where in the past you weren't able to own land, things like that, and pretty much generate generational wealth and, and pass that on to the next generation, as opposed to someone who first moved to America being uh, that's like white, were able to buy a house and then maybe pass that house on to a family member. And because now they don't have a house to worry about, they can focus on something else and they can pass that on and, you know, build. It, it's about potential generational wealth. Now, there are white people that were in situations that their relatives ain't leave them a goddamn thing. Like, <laughs> like they were just in a situation where they were just fucked. But the point being that the reason why you would be in that situation if you are white is because your family just either didn't save anything or maybe they lost it or maybe they weren't able to create it but the fact is the opportunity was there black people there was no opportunity you couldn't own it because you were not allowed to even if you had the means to make it work you weren't allowed to get it to work because from the very jump you couldn't do it it wasn't until I'd say four generations ago that that opportunity became available. And even then it was restricted. 
And then it wasn't until two generations ago, I'm gonna say two just because at this point, I think some families have had a previous generation that were after the civil rights movement. Um, there was only two generations where you had pretty much full access, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to clear up on that end. Um, the fact is the reason why that generational wealth didn't transfer in the white family isn't because of race. There was likely other factors what could lead to the family suffering and things like that. But the bottom line was it wasn't race tied. The black family, it was 100% race tied. Now, I'm sure there's going to be a really interesting discussion in the comments section. <laughs> I look forward to that, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let me know what you all think. Go uh, to the comment section, leave your discussions and things like that. Uh, as long as if everything is respectful, I have no problem allowing it uh discussions to be had um yeah i mean the last video the um the straight white male from bo burnham that comment section i have allowed to pretty much run without having any too much interference in because for the most part people have very reasonable discussions even people that might not disagree i mean even people that might not agree with me they don't come out and like attack and things like that so i have no issue with um leaving those comments there now i will debate you <laughs> if i feel like you're saying something that's wrong but as long as if you're not giving out misinformation or intentionally trying to um misrepresent or troll or anything like that then i have no problem with the discussions now this video is way too long this is pretty much a movie reaction at this point um Hopefully it won't destroy my uh, ability to for the video to process. I'm hoping it's able to be done within a certain period in time because my long videos take forever. Adobe Premiere, uh, Premiere Pro really has to work on that because once a video becomes so long, it's like it processes decent. Then once it hits a certain spot, it just like hits a crawl and it takes hours for it to finish. But um, and by the way, if anybody knows any solutions to that, please go to the comment section. And let me know. If you've been around here for an hour and a half, please give me a like, because at this point, I think I deserve it. <laughs> I mean, of course, you can give a like or not if you choose to. Hell, you can give a dislike if you choose to, but uh, give something. And yeah, if you have something you want to say, feel free to say it. Go to the comment section. Let me know. I'm going to give you the deuces. Uh, hopefully you've been enlightened. I look forward to seeing you guys on a future video. I, I had another video planned, but this one was so long that I'm probably going to push that off to later. Uh, I'm going to give you the deuces and I'm signing out. Peace.